Welcome everybody to our session and uh, our presentation on industry fusion, the democratization of industry 4.0. We will be three presenters today. Um, it's me, Matt and Marcel. Uh, to my person, I'm on the one hand uh, at the medium sized machine manufacturer called Microstep as head of research and development and specifically there for the industry 4.0 um, uh, uh, point of view. And on the other hand, I'm the technical lead of uh, the Industry Fusion Foundation and the Industry Fusion Solution, which we will present today. And so also from my background, um, I actually gap, uh, bridge the gap uh, between the OTE world and the IT world. And we will talk about that later much more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is Matt Mikulina. I also work at Microstep, um, this medium-sized machine manufacturer in the business development, also in the field of Industry 4.0. So, um, yeah, basically in that case, I work together with Konstantin and also my uh, yeah, second role, especially for Industry Fusion, for the Industry Fusion Foundation, is um, yeah, kind of the marketing, but also uh, transferring um, this idea of um, the application into usable UX and putting it into development. So uh, that's what I do for the project. Mm -hmm. And I'm Marcel Wagner. I'm a software application engineer at Intel's IoT Group. And I support industry fusion project, especially uh, when we look at the end-to-end -end perspective and the edge and the cloud and how it plays together. And I really like the open source aspect of it and uh, to contribute to it. Okay, yeah, and that's also the point uh, where we start. Basically here you can see one of our machines. We build CNC uh, cutting technology, so machines uh, with which you can uh, cut metals um, and any kind of materials in factories. So really cutting heavy metal. But the point is um, that you don't just have a single cutting machine in your um, yeah, shop floor, but it always comes with uh, many different um, processes that come together with the cutting. Like here together with our machines, we have the plasma sources connected. After that, you uh, you put these parts into sandblasting, um, then you weld them, you have some cranes or um, robots that pick up the pieces. Um, yeah, but um, the point is that in order to um, yeah have a smart factory, um, yeah, uh, these uh, equipments should all communicate together, but that's what definitely is not the case today. We could go then to the... Yeah, and that is also uh, basically the, the dilemma of the uh, current situation that many machine manufacturers produce uh, their machines and also deliver their uh, connectivity solutions or basically um, provide their um, software services and platforms together with these machines. Um, but what's definitely lacking is the interoperability uh, between these silos that kind of develop here and uh, what means that the end user, the factory operator, now has um, many different systems that he has to either uh, connect manually to each other and basically spend a lot of time um, to get them working together in one whole infrastructure or um, yeah, uh, in the other parts um, of many uh, medium-sized companies, they don't uh, cooperate together or communicate together at all. Yeah, and that's basically the point right now. And also, if you take a look at all that uh, from the business perspective, um, I mean, it is widely known among the companies, 63% what this study says, um, of the companies know that the digital transformation of their businesses will be very important for the future. Um, but then on the next step, only 11% of all these companies basically already have a um, digitalization strategy. So the gap between that is already uh, pretty wide. <laughs> but if you also take it one step further, only 0.7% uh, of all the revenue is already now generated by digital services. So, um, yeah, 
that is also where industry fusion comes into play. Um, basically, it is a IIoT connectivity solution for um, SMBs and basically companies of any uh, size, which is completely open under Apache uh, 2.0 and uh, which works completely vendor independent. You can connect uh, machines of different vendors um, into that platform and onboard them. It is built on state-of-the-art uh, IT frameworks, which make it completely scalable um, and um, making it able to expand with your operations. And of course, it offers all the uh, connectivity, uh, all the APIs, uh, basically to build a open ecosystem um, together also going above your factory. And all of these frameworks are uh, sorted out that they work uh, also on the edge, but also on the cloud, uh, like Kubernetes that we are building on. Mm -hmm. And here, Konstantin can give you a little um, yeah, intro how such a architecture of the factory looks like. Sure. Thanks, Matt, uh, for the introduction from, from a perspective of uh, what machine manufacturers and factory operators are actually uh, looking for. And that was uh, also the starting point uh, for the open source project industry fusion that we set uh, the two blue layers that you can see here, these typical layers of uh, connecting machines, connecting assets on the shop floor, bringing those data together uh, showing it uh, to the users and enabling an ecosystem on top of that. That was um, uh, our basic aspect, uh, which we had from the beginning on of the project. And uh, let's go a bit deeper into these uh, two layers. So the lower layer, what you can see here, which is connected uh, directly to the machine, is uh, responsible um, uh, for getting the data out of the machine and um, in new machines, you have maybe protocols like MQTT or OPC UA, but in a lot of old machines, um, you have uh, typically field buses like a, a Modbus or other field buses, or you don't even have um, a, a control system and you have to add additional uh, sensors uh, to the machine in uh, order uh, to get the information that you want out of the machine. The next step is um, that this uh, data that you actually get out of the machines often is uh, not semantically described because you only get, for example, uh, the number out of um, a certain register in a Siemens PLC that you uh, read. And then you have to define in the next step, what does the 27, for example, actually mean? Is it a, a voltage? Is it a temperature? Whatever it is. And um, uh, this is not only relevant for one machine, but at the end, you want, as a factory operator, of course, the transparency over all your different machines and um, et cetera. It's a very heterogeneous landscape from uh, different machine manufacturers that you have uh, on the shop floor. But as a factory operator, you, of course, want to see all these machines um, uh, in a transparent way uh, without uh, having to use uh, different applications or different um, cloud services from the different machines. So that is done uh, on the lower level. And sorry, you go, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, uh, and then on the upper level, uh, so that's then uh, the level where all the information from these different machines uh, come together, are processed, are stored, and are made available uh, to the, um, uh, on the one hand, to the factory operator, and on the one other hand, also, of course, uh, to further application services and so on that you can use within this ecosystem. So let's uh, go a bit deeper into it. Um, Marcel, the next slide, please. Um, as I said already, you have different layers and uh, with that also different stakeholders within the entire ecosystem that you have to bring together if you want to um, get a solution for the overall uh, smart factory. And we make uh, three layers here called ecosystem uh, manager, machine manufacturer, and factory operator, which actually are responsible for three uh, different parts uh, within the uh, ecosystem. So the most upper level, the ecosystem level, um, is responsible for achieving uh, the overall semantic model 
uh, for the vendor independent interoperability. Meaning um, there are general modeling elements, for example, like units, quantity types, metrics, attributes, and so on, are defined um, to achieve this uh, semantic model. And on the other hand, also for different asset uh, categories, for example, we saw uh, a cutting machine, um, uh, the meta models for these specific asset categories are defined. In the next step, uh, the machine manufacturer now uh, can use uh, these uh, meta models or these reference objects actually um, to digi digitize his assets and assets usually um, are machines uh, like cutting machines, welding machines, whatever, and build uh, then on top uh, of uh, these uh, digitized assets, of course, his uh, digital business models or uh, um, applications on top of it. So um, uh, what, what happens or what does the machine manufacturer do? Um, uh, he defines the asset series and the asset instance uh, according to the meta model. And um, of course, they are also defined uh, his manufacturer specific um, elements within this uh, entire um, uh, object. And then on the uh, lowest level, we have the factory operator. He is actually the one who receives uh, or buys the different machines um, and has, of course, also old machines, which he wants to retrofit. But uh, at the end, he wants to receive the transparent overview over his entire smart factory. And then, of course, um, use the potential of digitalization, um, have different dashboards, um, do different automation jobs with it, uh, maybe get uh, notified if something uh, is wrong in a smart factory and so on. And so, on. so he actually really uh, wants to use then uh, the, uh, the, the digital factory at the end. So if we look at uh, what, what really comes out uh, out of the different layers. Um, we have on the um, most upper level on the ecosystem layer, as I said, the semantic uh, definitions and the descriptions. Uh, so the uh, ontologies actually of uh, what on the one hand, the overall ontology and on the other hand, the uh, specific ontologies for the different uh, asset categories. Then we have um, uh, yeah, generic data service containers depending on um, uh, the uh, connectivity um, uh, uh, to the machine. As I said, that can be very uh, different according on the uh, type of the machine. And we have uh, infrastructure uh, descriptions. So uh, Kubernetes deployments, config maps, and so on. Marcel will uh, go into detail in, in that uh, later. Then the machine manufacturer, as I said, he runs through an imp implementation process uh, defining his uh, machines uh, and how the machines are connected and so on, which which data they can um, uh, actually deliver and how this uh, data is mapped then uh, to the overall semantic model. So we have different uh, YAML files for the machine configuration um, uh, defined through the uh, machine manufacturer. And then the factory operator, he of course um, has to configure his factory according to ISA 95, so um, his company, his different factory sites, and then his different uh, areas and the um, assets uh, that are then uh, included into this machine, uh, included into this factory. Sorry. Okay, um, let's go one level even deeper uh, and uh, look at um, uh, how it is uh, built up. Um, as you saw already, in the first overview slide of the architecture, each uh, smart box, so the uh, gateway that is connected to the machine, uh, runs, of course, uh, a, a Linux operating system. And, of, and on top of that, uh, 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 K3S, so uh, um, a, a, a Kubernetes uh, runtime engine. And each factory uh, site uh, is one uh, K3S cluster. So if you have different uh, machines with different gateways, they are all connected uh, to one cluster on the uh, shop floor. And on top of that, um, we have then the different um, uh, connectivity uh, parts uh, with, for the machine towards the, um, uh, to the smart factory. It can be 
uh, a PLC that runs directly um, on the gateway. If you, as I said, uh, you don't have um, uh, any uh, PLC in the machine. So if you do a retrofit and in future also custom uh, applications and containers, um, which are specific for this machine from the machine uh, manufacturer uh, can be deployed as well. Next slide, Marcel. So here we see once more um, uh, the gateway architecture from a bit of different perspective, how we um, uh, how we implemented it. And um, here you see once more also the different um, uh, um, uh, YAML files that were, as you saw in the slide uh, before, two slides before, which were defined by the um, machine manufacturer and the um, ecosystem manager, how they come into play here. So on the uh, total left-hand side, you see the, the physical asset, so typically a machine with a PLC. Uh, then you see the, the data service, the machine, uh, the machine connector, where we use uh, PLC4X uh, for the machines with uh, PLCs and uh, the typical field buses uh, we have there, especially, of course, Siemens PLCs, but also uh, other PLCs, which are connected, for example, via Modbus. And um, uh, the configuration, so the data service uh, YAML is used uh, on that side. So uh, if we got out the data of the machines in the first step uh, using, for example, PLC4X, uh, it is often the case, especially uh, with, um, uh, with older machines, uh, that you can't use the data directly as it is, for example, um, with new machines that have OPQA or MQTT. Um, so you actually want to uh, pre-process and maybe aggregate the data already um, on the gateway level, which is done in the next step in the, with the script service. And then in the third step, um, uh, this information uh, is collected and um, given as a fourth step to the uh, smart factory connector, which is responsible uh, for the northbound uh, connectivity um, uh, towards uh, the upper level, the smart factory. Uh, level, uh, um, yeah, and to handle actually this connectivity. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, as you saw, we have uh, many different components which come into play here, and in order uh, to orchestrate them, um, uh, Marcel will tell you now a bit how we actually uh, done uh, the uh, operation process. Yeah, thanks, Constantine. Yeah, what you see here is a high-level view or one of many views of uh, uh, a typical GitOps uh, flow. Um, so on the left side, uh, you have uh, code, um, you have configurations, you have um, code as infrastructure, so the inter infrastructure descriptions, declarations. Um, they are committed to a Git repository or to several Git repositories. And then you. this is triggering the CI, CD pipeline, um, and uh, if it uh, goes through, then uh, new containers are created and um, pushed to the registry, uh, and configurations and infrastructure is uh, pushed to the, um, the production repository. At the same time, you have uh, on the deployment or on the staging or on the test systems, uh, typically operators or components which monitor changes and in case there are changes they are pulled or and the system is updated so um, this looks very straightforward but let's remember what Constantine told us about um, uh, that we have several layers and that means you have different partners um, components involved with uh, different layers of um, privacy. Um, the first one, or with the IP protection, the first one is the ecosystem level, right? And uh, we get um, specific containers out of that uh, and um, description on how um, those um, components, uh, containers, are put together uh, in form of deployments, Kubernetes deployments, how they are configured in form of config maps, um, where they store the secret data and so on. Then the machine manufacturer 
they provide, as we just have seen, components um, to read out data from the specific machines, but also to process it in a way that it conforms with the semantic definition, which is defined in the ecosystem layer. And finally, the factory operator who has a view to all machines and how all, all machines are linked um, has to create also a configuration which is describing this. And therefore, the challenge is to have different sources from different parties uh, to bring them together. Well, again, GitOps is, of course, ideal for that. So here you see um, an example there uh, for, for an onboarding of workloads to the gateways. So the factory manager, the tool or person are pushing the uh, description to the private factory config. And then a GitOps tool is monitoring that dependent on the description, pulling from the machine manufacturer their configurations and descriptions for their machine. So assuming that the um, factory has a lot of machines and those other machines are linked, it has to get access to different kind of repositories from different machine vendors. And then, of course, it needs to pull the data from the industry fusion ecosystem, um, which is public. Uh, so um, most of the, or the generic containers and generic part of the deployment. Then at the same time to onboard, uh, the uh, tool is connecting the industry, industry fusion local instance for the factory and registering the new or the, the devices which are um, changed and uh, is, is uh, pushing the resulting Kubernetes deployment to the master and the master is distributing it to the right workers and everyone is pulling the containers from the industry fusion registry. Um, uh, it can also, I mean, today we have uh, mainly um, public containers, but it can of course also be that there are closed ones. Uh, the IoT middleware um, is designed uh, with very high level principle. First of all, it must be important that um, the project wants to reuse existing open source projects where possible, ideally uh, controlled, managed by an open source body. But important is that the open source components have a large community and high maturity, also some operational culture. Um, uh, that means um, there should be horizontal platform which are not um, developed for one single purpose, but more like having a larger usage. And uh, finally, they must be compatible with Apache 2.0 license. You really look at fully open source, everything must be open, including testing, scaling, availability, and uh, operation. Uh, why is that? Because we, in, in the project, there are partners on different partners who are operating the platform on the edge, but also in the cloud. And therefore the knowledge to operate those, this platform must be very broad. Um, the development uh, is um, done on a Kubernetes platform. Uh, so it's made in a way that it uh, runs on every managed Kubernetes and um, runs on every certified Kubernetes Edge platform, such as K3S. The assumption is develop once, deploy everywhere. So Cloud and Edge should run Kubernetes and the application should, uh, the middleware should run on it. This is the um, high level view of the middleware. So for, for people who attended last year, there are some changes. Um, or they would notice some changes. So on the left side, you see the, the, the APIs, uh, the devices and the industry fusion app, and both are using partially common, partially separated APIs. One uh, new component here is the NGS LED context broker. 
which is managing objects and states and instances in the factory. The other new component here is the new MQTT broker, which is MQX and has been selected because it has a broad ecosystem. It's open, um, so not only the single instance, but also the scalability is open. Um, the third new component is Alerta, which is used for from the uh, industry fusion applications to get access to all kinds of alerts um, from the platform. And the nice thing from Alerta is that it um, can provide different roles and different kind of uh, alert um, uh, classes. It's, do, it's, it's doing it's doing correlation and removing uh, duplicates and so on. Then when you look at the central part, then that's very uh, similar, if not identical to what we have shown last year. So Kafka is still the central message bus, the central platform, even more central than before. And everything which is processed on Kafka is today done by Flink have link runtime, um, partially with Apache Beam, partially with native Flink applications. And the whole system is more moving towards a streaming SQL usage. So we have uh, a rule engine, which is still implemented in Beam. We have, um, uh, but uh, we have additional digital twin processing elements which are now fully use streaming SQL to define and describe more complex use cases. Then um, we have other usual suspects like Redis and Postgres um, for storing data. We are still using Kairos DB on Cassandra, but other options are discussed as well. So what is so special about the service architecture? As I said, <clears throat> Apache, Kafka, and Flink are very central for working with different components. So you see an example, the MQD broker is sending the incoming data to a MQD Kafka bridge, and the MQD Kafka bridge is sending it to a topic, a Kafka topic called metrics. Another example is the allotter. Um, so Alerter, the Alerter bridge, uh, you see uh, on the um, south side, is consuming from a topic called alerts and forwarding the alerts with the REST API to Alerter. And with the same approach, other um, services are integrated. So there are always small little bridges who read or send to Kafka and read or send from different APIs. And the uh, platform is capable of processing data so that you can forward it to a warm storage, like a local time series database or colder storage to the cloud, or even doing data sharing with different partners to process the data in a way that partners like machine builders from a factory get data of only of their machines. Why is that design like this? Um, so if you have a design like this, you know, then you can process everything with streaming SQL. So um, Flink allows uh, with that uh, approach to create um, an, um, a mapping between topics and tables. So your streaming SQL operates on tables because SQL operates on tables, but in fact, you're operating on, on topics. So with this, with this approach, you have first to alert to, to create tables, which is here on the left side, you see an example for how the alert table is created, which contains, for instance, an object for describing which resources, the resources creating the alert, which event was creating the alert, what is severity of the alert. And then you see below that in the SQL command, you also define that it could, should connect to Kafka. Of course, you have also to provide Kafka connection details. 
But here, most important, it's defining uh, or linking the alert topic to the table. On the right side, you see the same happening with the matrix table. So the, um, <clears throat> it, it defines components of the matrix, like as an example here, name and value <clears throat> of matrix. And then you link it with the matrix topic. So why is that? This approach you can easily operate um, on using Fling and operate on Kafka and on the services. For instance, you can write a very simple SQL command to um, select uh, components from a metric and check uh, conditions. Here, in this case, you have to check whether the component has the right name. Of course, in uh, reality, the name is more complicated because it must be unique. But here, let's say it's temperature. And then you have uh, you check whether, for instance, the value of the temperature has is above a certain point. On the right side, you see how can I, for instance, create alerts. So that is done with an insert SQL command. You, you insert into the alerts table, like, you know, this is my resource, this is my event, that's my environment. And then you create an alert table because over the bridge is re it's reaching alert time. These are, of course, very simple examples, but in fact, you can combine this and use the full power of all SQL or streaming SQL, which is supported in Flink, uh, to apply more complex rules and even combine a set of um, SQL scripts to uh, to achieve very complex aggregation and very complex logic. How do we manage this? Um, the SQL streaming SQL scripts are managed with Kubernetes. So uh, Kubernetes allows to define own resources called custom resource definitions. And we created two. One is called Beam SQL statement set, and the other one is called Beam SQL table. And to those can be submitted to Kubernetes and an operator which is implemented in Python and, and the COP framework is monitoring the CRDs and deploying them to Flink and making sure that, um, that they are running or when the platform is um, restarted that everything which is needed is running. In future, it will also help to use safe points, make sure that the state is not lost that is currently not the case, but it will be one of the next steps. On the left side, on the right side, you see uh, an, in, an example for a create table object. Um, so Beam SQL table, and then you put more or less what you just saw in the um, streaming SQL command, more in uh, put into a YAML object. And uh, on the um, right lower part, you see uh, how SQL instructions are managed. So you create another object and you can put a set of SQL statements into it. And the and, and, uh, um, Flink is then put them in, in one in one job and um, optimize it as one uh, big pipeline. And I, um, for the uh, final slide, I give back to Konstantin. Yeah, thanks Marcel. So uh, we made a, a bit of deep dive uh, today into the topics we are currently also uh, working on and uh, which are uh, new within the last uh, month. But uh, to sum it up, um, yeah, I want to highlight once more that, uh, as you hopefully also could see in the presentation today, that Industry 4.0 cannot be solved by one single manufacturer or uh, one single um, uh, solution for getting all the machines together. And there we see especially that open source solutions are actually the key to get this cross manufacturer interoperability uh, in the smart factories that is needed uh, to really uh, use the potential of digitalization also for uh, small and medium sized uh, enterprises. Uh, as we showed, we use a, a fully uh, Kubernetes based approach um, for reasons of scalability. Uh, a multi-environment deployment, so we want to uh, be able to deploy it at every cloud service provider that has a managed Kubernetes um, uh, on premises on a server if somebody wants, as well as uh, the different uh, smart uh, gateways that we use on the uh, different machines um, to to also use them there, which of course allows also a faster updates if new features are there or if a new version of uh, the different uh, 
um, containers shall be deployed. Well, our next step now, of course, to, to grow the project and to grow the Industry Fusion Foundation uh, even further over the last uh, month. A lot of uh, things happened there already, but of course, uh, within the next year, we also want to uh, get a growing community here. Uh, we will extend also the frameworks, of course, uh, with more features, align them also with other uh, initiatives. We do that, uh, of course, uh, as, as far as possible, but there are new in, uh, initiatives arising also. Gaia-X gets more and more now uh, into its implementation phase, where we, of course, also uh, align with the stakeholders there. And uh, the digital twin, which uh, was shortly mentioned today already, uh, we will uh, now focus in the next month very strongly on that uh, to enhance this uh, capabilities to really um, uh, use these features in a yeah, near real time actually um, processing of the data uh, within the ecosystem. So uh, if you want to join uh, into this project or learn more about uh, this project, uh, feel free to reach uh, out to us, uh, visit our uh, website uh, on industryfusion.com or our GitHub uh, repository um, uh, where you can uh, find uh, all the, the, the relevant information, how you can contact us and how you can uh, participate. And uh, we are open for everybody who wants to um, help democratization of uh, Industry 4.0. With that, we all want to thank you uh, for listening, for joining. And if there are any questions open, I think we have one minute left uh, for a Q&A session. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Okay, I think no questions. Good. Uh, I think there are no further questions directly now. Um, of course, as I said, feel free to contact us. And as you also said, maybe we join also the next session uh, if there are any questions there. Uh, good. So. Have a nice evening, everybody, and hope to hear you. Yep. Ciao together. Goodbye. Bye.